All right, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. Good to be here. Uh, I'm thinking of this as four sessions, uh, two this morning. The third will be in Grace Baptist Church's regular service tomorrow, early afternoon, and then the fourth is at three o'clock. So uh, we're going to give you a handout in a minute that has all four of them, the notes for that in it. I, I asked them not to give it to you yet because I'm afraid that if you look at it right now, you're going to think weirdest parenting conference I've ever seen when you see the handout. So I want to be able to explain first and then, uh, and then give you the handout. But first of all, I just want to say it's such a privilege to be back here in the city with you. And my wife, Crystal, is here with me. And the last time she and I were here was 27 years ago when almost exactly 27 years, when we were here on a high school senior trip together. And um, they used, uh, before that trip, we just knew of each other. We didn't really have any, we hadn't really talked or anything. Um, on, but on that trip, they used a buddy system. They paired up guys and girls for our days here in the city. Um, and uh, two of those days, we just happened to be paired up together. And at the uh, there, was a, there was something else going on, though, because I had a teacher who on that trip had told me I had to ask her out on a date, and he wasn't going to let it go until I did. He kept asking me, have you asked her out yet? And so I picked my spot. We were on the M train from Coney Island back up into the middle of Brooklyn, and there's a big cemetery there that the train goes up and over. Some of you probably know just what I'm talking about. That was my spot. Truly, I asked her out for the first time. And uh, so Monday, we're going to go f get back on the M train. Uh, uh, I told somebody that yesterday, and they said, no, this morning, they said, oh, yuck. <laughs> so, but for, for better or worse, we're going to go uh, back to the place where I first asked her out. And, um, and uh, we fell very quickly in love. And survived dating all the way through college, and then got married two days after graduation. And now we've got four girls from kindergarten to college. Um, but, so, but we haven't been back here. I've been back to the city, but she and I haven't been back to the city for 27 years since then. So, so cool. And if you would have asked me as an 18 or 19 year old where I was going to spend my life, I would have told you New York City. Somehow I had the wrong corner of the country. <laughs> Uh, but that's what I thought. So I really, really do love to be here. Our girls aren't with us. They are, they are back home. And so they are 18 on the far side, 17, 13, 5. And uh, Abby, Katie, Esther, Nadia. And uh, here they are. We have palm trees in our family pictures. It's not, it's not New York. Uh, there's uh, mom and the youngest. And... The two oldest goofing off, and the oldest was just back for spring break. She just started college, and uh, so oldest and youngest, very happy to be back together uh, this last week. So they're back home in Southern California, and we are here to talk about courageous parenting. And um, I, I, you might think that I showed you these happy, smiling pictures to make sure that everyone knows that we have such a perfect family that you should listen to us talk about parenting. Um, but I hope you know that that's not the case at all. And even this week, it was a rough parenting week for us. Um, it was good and humbling. And so we are, we are parents who need courage just as much as you, and we are here to learn together. So let me hear from you. Let's name a bunch of reasons why parenting can be intimidating these days. I could use, and I started to do this, I could use statistics, I could use headlines, um, but I'm not so much interested in them telling us what the challenges are as much as us saying what the challenges are. So let's just name a bunch of things. Chime in with something. What makes parenting hard, challenging, intimidating, confusing uh, in these times that we're living in? Outside influences? Television? Television? Yeah, phones. Technology. technology in general? You hate technology? Okay, technology that drives us nuts? Yes? Peer pressure? Peer pressure? It's expensive. 
cost, yeah. Schooling, hard schooling decisions, which relates to cost decisions and peer pressure decisions, yeah. Sin, yes, the problem of problems, right? Yes? Yeah, politics and political decisions that end up directly influencing our kids. Zombies? Yeah, zombies. A close second threat right after sin, our children. Anything else? Yes? Drugs. Ungodly advice, yeah. Other challenges, if you just walked in, we're just naming some of the things that make ch parenting really challenging, really intimidating these days. A couple more, yes, back there? Caregiving. Caregiving. Yeah, when you're trying to give care in more than one direction, not just toward children. Yes? Yes, okay, all the gender issues. Okay, so we can keep going. Let's not discourage ourselves entirely. Here is, here is a mental image I want you to hold on to this weekend. Picture a boxing ring, and there are two competitors coming from their corners toward the center of the ring to face each other. And this is a fight for the future of our children. And on one hand, on one side, you have the world that we live in, and we just described some of the challenges. It's huge, it's intimidating, it's really powerful. It controls all of the media and politics and sports and, and libraries and music and Hollywood and education. And all of that influence pours into our TVs, computers, tablets, phones in everybody's pocket. Everything's on their side, all right? So picture a boxing ring and that fight for our children, and we have this one competitor over here, this is the world, and he's a giant of a boxer with big broad shoulders and a neck like a tree trunk and huge bulging muscles, and he's coming across the ring, and we're gonna duke it out for our kids, right? And on the other side of the ring, it's us, the parents, little scrawny things. I'm 150 pounds when wet and probably can't figure out how to tie my shorts on. I don't know how to box. So on one side, there's this mighty monster of a boxer, and then there's little scrawny me. And I don't know what I'm doing as a parent. I can't even figure out when my kid, you know, when I should, should I take him to the doctor, should I not take, I can't even make little decisions like that. And I've got this behemoth of the world that I'm up against in parenting. Uh, it, it, my point is that it can feel like, what chance do parents even have today? I mean, if it's you against Hollywood, if it's you against the cultural forces, if it's you against all this, what chance do you even have? And yet, in reality, that picture is all wrong. Because while the world is intimidating and influential, parents have every reason to be courageous and to step into that ring with confidence. Why? Because the truth is on your side. What does the world have? They've got lights and sound and fog machines and technology and marketing and videography and music. They've got the universities and the libraries and the state houses. But what they don't have is truth. They've got smoke and mirrors and lies and tricks and games. They don't have real answers. They don't have real hope. They don't have real explanations. They don't have the truth. And if the truth is in your corner, you have every reason to be a courageous parent. That's what I want to show you this morning. Now, so just real quickly, here's where we're headed. There are two sessions this morning, and they're not the same. They build on each other. That's about when the truth is on your side. The session in the, the 1 o'clock church service tomorrow is called The Courage to Look Inside. The 3 o'clock session tomorrow is Taking the First Steps of Courage. How do we practically put feet toward courageous parenting? So let's uh, talk about authority for a moment. Why am I teaching you about parenting? I've got four daughters from the ages of 5 to 18, but that's hardly reason to listen to me. 
But the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, we'll be in 2 Timothy again tomorrow, all scripture is breathed out by God. And so what that's telling us is that the very words of scripture are the words of God, and he is the truth. Everything he says is true. Now, I realize that you might not believe that, but you don't have to believe that to stick with me this morning. And here's why. Because in, we hear the world's explanations about what's going on, about what's wrong, and about how to fix it. We hear those explanations all the time, right? It's worth hearing the Bible's explanation. The world has their explanations, but the world is also a complete wreck. Just look at the news. Are the politicians who, who always promise all the answers really able to fix this mess? Or, and I have, I have tremendous respect from edu for educators and scientists and so forth, but they sometimes sound like they do know everything, but they're not getting us out of this mess. And so, regardless of what you think of the Bible, it is best-selling and most influential book in the history of the world. And so, it's worth asking, how would the Bible explain this world that we're in? What would the Bible say? So that's what we're going to do this morning. And to make sure I, I give credit where credit is due, some of the concepts that I'm going to be sharing with you this morning come from Dr. Christopher Watkins book, Biblical Critical Theory. You've heard the term critical theory, of course, right? Because it's been such a hot button topic. A, a critical theory is an explanation of the story behind the story. In other words, as you look out at a messed up world, what's the underlying explanation? What's really going on? And a critical theory claims to tell you that. So most often you hear about critical what? Theory. Critical race theory, which is saying, if you want the underlying explanation for everything that's going on, it's racism. That's the underlying explanation. But there's also, there are also critical theories about economics and class struggle, that that's what's really going on. Or a critical theory can be about sexuality or gender, that that's what's really going on. So the world has a number of critical theories to explain it all. But I would argue that those explanations are at best partially true, sometimes completely false, and I would argue that they always fail to provide a full explanation of what's going on. And they definitely fail to provide real answers and real hope. So I want to show you, I want to try to show you this morning that the Bible's explanation of what's going on in the world is so much better. And as a result, the Bible's answers are so much better. So we're going to start at the beginning of the Bible we're just going to skim our way through the Bible's explanation of what's really going on in the world today. And I, I just, my hope is that you'll say, wow, that's just what my kids need. Because <laughs> it's just what you need. And that in your mind, that mental image of little you taking on the monster of the world might flip. And you may, might start to realize that, man, if the truth is on my side, by God's strength, we can do this. That's, that's what I hope. So related, one more thing. Uh, oh, can we get the handout now? That would be great. And one more thing before we get started into the, con into the context. If you ask me, why are you a Christian? There are a couple different ways I can answer that. There are, there are spiritual answers to that question. Like Christians believe that God works spiritually in our hearts to bring us to him, a right relationship with God. So, so in one sense, the answer to why am I a Christian, I would, there's like a spiritual answer to that. But you could also ask me this, why do you believe Christianity is true? From a, like a factual standpoint, why am I persuaded that Christianity is true? And I think my top three reasons, though, I'm not trying to put these in any particular order. 
But my top three reasons for why I believe Christianity are tr is true would be, number one, there is no other book like the Bible. Number two, there is significant historical evidence for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So number one, there's no other book like the Bible. Number two, there's significant historical evidence for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But then number three, and this is the one that connects today, the third reason why I am convinced Christianity is true is because the, is because the Bible explains the world we live in far better than any other explanation I've ever heard. And that, to me, is a very compelling reason for Christianity. Not the only one, but a very compelling one. And so what, what little, that, that's so meaningful to me as a parent, because what these little human beings are trying to do as they grow up is figure out what this life is, what it's about, why they matter, what is worth living for? What's going to make them happy? What relationships are all about? Are they really loved? I'm not saying they could articulate all that, but that's what every child grows up grasping to try to figure out from this life. And the world's answers that seem so powerful are causing so much damage. That's what's all over the headlines in the statistics, that the next generation is largely... Bored, lonely, depressed, anxious, and suicidal. Despite the fact that all the world's best critical theories are getting crammed down their throats all the time. There has to be something better that we could offer to the next generation to help them make sense of this. Something that's true. So let me try to show you, okay? So first of all, we're going to spend a lot of time in Genesis. I, maybe this, yeah. This whole first session is Genesis, and then some in the next one. First verse in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So first of all, creator. Everybody got handout? We're good to go there? Okay, great. So from the very first moments, the truth about the universe begins with a personal creator. In contrast to the very impersonal views of origins that are taught in all the schools, where everything exists by random chance. Instead, the truth begins with a personal creator, which means the universe is not this cold and indifferent place fueled by pure accident and survival of the fittest. It is personal. And secondly, it is also relational. There is relationship in God himself. The Bible teaches one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. So there is relationship in God himself. But then when God creates human beings, God related to them. He connected to them. So the universe is personal and it's relational. It's not cold and indifferent. But there's something else we need to note about creator and creation, and that is that in creation itself, we see the goodness and the generosity of God. We might even say that creation itself is a gift of grace. For example, why are there beautiful sights like a human eye and brain able to distinguish between 7 and 10 million colors. Why? We could have gotten by with 3 or 5 or 10. But no, God creates 7 to 10 million. Why do our eyes and minds work in such a way that those beautiful sights can bring us such pleasure? How about beautiful sounds? Why is music so magical and so meaningful? How about good food? I mean, food could just be necessary, necessary nourishment. And some people seem to make, want, think that we should all just eat it for necessary nourishment. Don't eat it when it tastes good. But in reality, food can taste really good, right? You can be really excited about, about a meal. Why is that? These are just little examples of the goodness and the generosity of God in creation. The way Christopher Watkins says it, God's creation is not minimalist. God created a superabundant world fit to foster the flourishing of his creatures. Now, of course, it's true that man's evil has also made a mess of that world and done a lot of damage to God's creation. 
And yet, the joy of the sights, the sounds, the food, the relationships, we continue to get to taste God's goodness and generosity every day. And not only that, but in creation, we, we also see such incredible wisdom. For the universe is not only incredibly creative, but it's also incredibly ordered. Like, think about that heart of yours. That I, I, I've got a dear friend that just had triple bypass a week ago Friday. Open heart surgery. Astonishing. Think about that heart of yours that just beats the right amount of blood with the right amount of oxygen to your muscles and tissues and brain. I'm thinking about it because they're trying to get his medications just right, right, to balance out pulse and everything after open heart surgery. They're trying to figure out how to do what God built in from the beginning. It's incredible order. Or think about music. I am not a musician, but I'm like a music nerd. The marvel of music is that it has so much order. And if you are musicians, you know there's this mathematical order in music that's astonishing. And our brains, you don't teach a child the math of music before they can understand music. Their brain just figures it out. But then what our brains love about music is that there's all this order, there's all this math, and then there are all these surprises. And our brains are wired in such a way that we start to figure out maybe when the surprises are coming. And we love figuring out, you know what it's like when you're listening to music and you're like, here it comes, there it is, right? God, you, by the way, pick up Dan Levitin's book, This Is Your Brain on Music. It is astonishing. Where does all that come from? This kind of God. And so how can I give my kids hope in a terrible and a terrifying world? Start by teaching them that they live in a world that is very broken, but a world that was created by a personal, relational, good, generous, gracious God. They live in a world where there is a personal God and where grace exists. And they, you can teach your children to marvel at God's gifts that we get to enjoy every day. Sometimes I gather my kids around the sound system And I'm like, you've just got to hear this chord. (laughs) And I'll show them a piece of music where there's this chord that is like, whoa, look at that. It may not be music for you. It may be other things. But you can show your kids the beauty, the wonder of what God created and teach them about a personal, relational, good, generous, gracious God. Now that creation reached its climax in the creation of people. Genesis 1, then verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So this is man. People were made in the image of God. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what that means that we can't try to get into right now, but somehow humans are a reflection of God in a way that's unique from all the rest of creation. And God did that intentionally. We didn't accidentally rise to the top of the evolutionary food chain. God made this human part of creation to be special to be especially near him, to be in some ways like him. And this gives all people inherent dignity. When God created all people in his image, dignity is not measured by whether you are a six-month-old fetus or a 96-year-old on your deathbed. Dignity is not measured by how much money you have, what kind of car you drive, who your parents were, how much mental ability you have or don't have, how much physical ability you have or don't have. In a world where God created people in his image, it's not a dog-eat-dog world where whoever has the most power wins. It is a world where even the weakest and most vulnerable have equal dignity. That's only possible because God created in his image. Beyond that, creation in God's image is such marvelous news because it means there is a foundation for ethics. 
in an evolutionary world do, view, just do whatever you have to do to win. But the Bible says there's a reason why you shouldn't kill. There's a reason why you shouldn't lie. There's a reason why you shouldn't steal. There's a reason why you shouldn't hate. And it's because that person you killed, lied to, stole from, hated, was a person created in the image of God. There's a foundation for actual right and wrong in the way people treat one another in the creation of God. And thirdly, there is meaning. The world tells kids today, you can be anything you want to be. And, and I get it that the idea there is potential and empowerment. There's a little bit of truth to that. But in reality, we're putting a tremendous burden upon kids to prove that your life has meaning. We're telling them they need to invent their own meaning. Or as we'll say later, create their own identity. How much better to start from the found, this foundation that I have meaning already. I have value already because God created me in his image. That is so free. This also gives us, God's creation of man in his image also gives us purpose. God created human beings on purpose, with purpose. We, we you know, we say to kids, who are you going to be when you grow up? You know, are you going to be the next president? Are you going to be the next Aaron Judge? Are you going to be an astronaut? Are you going to be a musician? And what that makes it clear is that it's up to the kid to figure all that out. It's up to you. Decide it, define it, make it happen. Now, again, I understand the idea is to encourage and empower kids about their potential, but that is almost oppress oppressive. Uh, it, it's, it's putting on kids a pressure more than we were meant to bear because we were never meant to define our own life purpose. We have a creator who defined it, and that's actually really good news. I know that the human heart apart from God hates that and says, no, I want to do all my own thing, but there is not freedom and I want to do all my own thing. That's actually a burden you were never meant to bear. There is purpose. And finally, God's creation in his image gives definition and order to the things that are so undefined and confusing right now for our children. I, we bring home books from the library sometimes and there's you know, two dads in this story. My daughter is in a community choir and she was just two weeks ago headed into the bathroom and there a man dressed like a woman cut into the women's restroom ahead of her. Um, so our kids are just seeing this confusion. What, what is maleness and femaleness? What, what is man and woman? What is marriage? What even is gender? What is sexual identity? And and my point's not to get down into those details, but to, to connect this to what we've been saying, kids today are expected to not only define their own meaning and define their own purpose, but they're also expected to define their own gender and define their own sexual identity from a huge buffet of choices. There are so many headlines about the teen mental health crisis and the evidence is just increasingly showing how much gender and sexuality are at the forefront of that crisis. But I think we should look at that and say, of course, we've torn away parts of the very foundation of human identity and we've handed the scraps to the children and said, you figure it out. And we wonder why their mental health is, is spiraling. Meanwhile, the Bible gives this, this like, rock of hope and confidence and clarity, male and female, he created them. And if you go from Genesis 1, male and female, to Genesis 2, in Genesis 2, male and female are man and woman. Male is manhood, woman is femalehood, and it's foundational. And then in Genesis 2, 24, God brings the woman to the man because it's not good for the man to be alone, and they hold fast, and they become one flesh in this beautiful God-ordained marriage, and from that flows God's plan for the beauty and value of sex. What a contrast to this world where sex is everything, and yet sex is nothing. 
You know what I'm saying? Sex is everything. It is. It's the Freudian view that the entirety of humanity is driven by sex, while at the same time, it's nothing. You go meet somebody at a bar, you think they're cute, and the next thing you know, you're having sex with them. Well, what is it? Is it everything or is it nothing? The Bible has a much better explanation for all of that. For gender, for sexuality, for marriage, and then out of that flows the biblical teachings about parenting and family. It says one of the reasons why you can have courage, because if you go look at all the statistics of what's best for kids, if we just ask that question, what's best for kids, the statistics say that what's best for kids is what the Bible said all along. What's best for kids is one man and one woman in a covenant marriage, faithful to one another for life, who are loving and kind to one another and parent their children with courage and love. That's what's best for the kids, which is exactly what God defined all along. So see, in, in our boxing illustration, are you starting to see why the world isn't the big hulking power? It's actually the truth that is, has the weight in this fight not the lies, not the falsehoods that are so damaging. Okay, so we've talked about creator. We've talked about man. Now we come down just a few verses to Genesis 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who, were with her, who was with her, and he ate. And then, if we go down to verse 11, he said, God said to them, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? So here is sin. Humanity rebelled against their creator. Now today, people don't want to talk about sin. Though our president used the word, maybe for the first time last week, you might have seen those headlines. But they have no idea how much we lose when we discard the truth about sin. For example, when we discard the truth about sin, we then believe the lie of autonomy. Autonomy means I create my own laws. I do whatever I want to do. And if there is anything that the world today believes is absolute truth, it's that you should be able to do whatever you want to do. That's the one absolute truth. What's more important for anything else is that you get to do whatever you want to do. Um, the one famous philosopher, Elsa, said, <laughs> no right, no wrong, no rules for me. And you probably know what comes next. I'm free. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. And you can find a similar idea in the words of every Disney princess because the world assumes that the greatest good of all is your autonomy and the Bible exposes the truth that autonomy is a lie. Autonomy is, has violent consequences. I mean, just look at our picture. <laughs> autonomy is going to bring me into conflict with you because I rule my little kingdom and I want everywhere to be my kingdom. I want everywhere I go and everything in my life to be just what I want it to be. And that's great as long as you and I don't happen to cross paths. <laughs> but as soon as our two little kingdoms try to share some of the same territory, somebody's got to win. We've got to fight. Either you're going to get your way or I'm going to get my way. Autonomy is inherently conflictual. It leads to violence. And interest, interestingly, the end result of evolution is also violence. Evolution is in, inherently conflictual. It's you against me to see whose DNA is going to survive and get through this. See, when the world says, no right, no wrong, no rules for me, it sounds so good and it's so wrong. It's so damaging. They know that, they just don't care because it sells to the human heart. Sin is real because there is a creator and we are responsible to him. He is truly on charge. Autonomy is a lie and it's devastating. But next, 
the truth, the truth about sin is dignifying. Now, I'm not saying that sin is dignifying, it's not. But the truth that humanity has sinned and fallen is actually dignifying. Because otherwise, the mess that I'm going to see when I check my phone in the news this morning, hey, by the way, that's, that's the Oculus in the World Trade Center is my background on my phone. Love the city. Um, the news that I'm going to find on my phone this morning about this world of violence and lies and anger and terrorism and hatred, this is how we, where we've gotten after two million years of human evolution. That's what evolution says. You've had humans for about two million years. This is how far we've gotten. And so from that worldview, we are the pinnacle so far. So can you see what I'm saying when I say it's actually far more dignifying when the Bible tells us that the truth is that humanity has fallen. Not that for two million years we've been getting better and better and this is as far as we've gotten, but rather that we have fallen from something that was far better. Remember, we were created in the image of God. God looked at his creation and said, this is good. And then we rebelled against God and we fell. We became cursed. Sin became like the ultimate Cancer and, and jealousy and murder entered Adam and Eve's family and their kids from the very beginning. And so without the truth about sin, there is very little hope. I mean, maybe another two million years will get us a little further along the road, but most of us aren't going to be here two million years from now to see what's better. We are stuck. But if we're fallen from something better, then there's potentially hope. If we were made for more than this by a good and generous creator, then there's potentially hope. So parents, I know that the world makes you feel like talking about sin is embarrassing. They've got, Crystal on the plane yesterday was talking to a 24-year-old next to her. And the 24-year-old, Crystal gave her a card with a, a QR code to a, video, a gospel video. And, and the girl said, oh, yeah, I'll take it. I'm all about acceptance. All about acceptance. And so in that world, when you as a parent are like, eh, I think I need to teach my kids about sin, you're almost embarrassed. Like, oh, I got to talk to my kids about this embarrassing thing, sin. Folks, the doctrine of sin is not embarrassing. It is dignifying. The truth that man has fallen from a good creation by a good creator is great news. Sin itself is not great news. But the truth about sin is dignifying for humanity. And so here's a question. You see these headlines, right? When there's like a school shooting or something, you'll see headlines in the news that say how to talk to your, par how, how, how to talk to your kids about you know, school shooting or something. You know, and it's a psychologist giving their advice. And so I want to ask this question. How do you help your children make sense of a world in which people do amazing, kind, generous things, because they do, right? Like you can follow on social media these like people who post, you know, happy videos every day, and it's all this amazing stuff people do, kind, generous stuff. How can we live in a world where people do stuff like that and a world where people do horrific, barbaric things? Now, you know what the world's answer is? The world's answer is there are good people in the world and there are evil people in the world. And we're all the good people. We're not the evil people out there who do those things. Until the barbaric things happen. And then what do they say? We never thought that person would do it. What? You see what they're trying to say? The world divides into good people and evil people. The good people do good things. The evil people do evil things. And yet, in reality, that does not line up to what any of us see. And it doesn't line up to what your kids see if they actually look deeply in their own hearts. The world tells your kids, look in your heart and you're going to find all this goodness. But at some point, your kids are probably going to look in their heart and find out it's not quite as beautiful as the world tells them it is. Right? So how do we explain a world in which there can be such jarring 
contradictions. So what would be the Bible answer? Why can we see so much goodness in the world and so much evil in the world? The Bible's image is, the Bible's answer is creation in the image of God and fall. So the human heart has both potential for tremendous evil and potential for tremendous good, both residing in the human heart. That's why we can live in a world with such jarring contradictions. And even the same people can do good one day and evil the next, or good to some people and evil to others. The Bible explains it. All right. Let's keep going in Genesis 10.54. I'm in trouble. Genesis 3.24. He drove out the man, God did, after they sinned. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. I'm going to jump ahead to Genesis chapter 7, verse 23. This is the flood. God blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. This is judgment. The Bible teaches that God is holy and just. He's holy so he cannot tolerate sin. He is just so he cannot leave sin unpunished. He is creator, lawgiver, and judge. And the Bible teaches that we are all sinners who are all guilty before him. So we're all facing God's judgment. Now, in a sense, this is obviously not good news. We are in trouble with God. It is, however, true, important. It is better to know the truth than to live in the fantasy of a dangerous lie. I've done, I've done hospital chaplaincy for many years, and so many times I've spoken with patients who are waiting for serious test results, you know, like biopsy results to come back. And so many times they've said to me something like, I'm just sick of waiting. I just want to know, even if it's bad news, just tell me what it is. Just give me the news. Judgment is bad news, but it's important. Because without the truth of judgment, we are completely ignorant of our eternal danger. So like sin, judgment might feel like a truth you're kind of embarrassed about as a parent. You know, you don't go to the park and want other parents to overhear you talking to your kids about judgment. It's kind of embarrassing, but it's actually not. Even though the world is telling young people how amazing they are, we do need to tell young people the truth about God and about the danger of sin. And it's not embarrassing because without the truth of judgment, we don't realize that there is amazing hope for guilty sinners. We can lie to the person and tell them they don't have cancer. But if we do that, they're not going to meet the oncologist who might be able to tell them there are some answers. And so it is important that we help our children begin to understand judgment. Not only that, but as, as Christopher Walken points out, a universe with a God of justice is much better than a universe where there is no justice. If there is no holy God, and if there is no judge, then all that matters in this life is whether you can get away with it. And so if you happen to live, as is true in so many places in the world, if you happen to have enough money and live in an area where you've got the law enforcement bought off, you're good. Do whatever you want. Because you've got law enforcement in your back pocket. If you happen to know a judge who's a friend, and so you know you can get away with stuff, great. If you happen to have figured out a way to hack the computer system at your company and embezzle money and nobody figures it out, great. You're getting away with it. If, in a world in which there's no holy God and no justice, then whatever you can get away with is great. Do it. Because there is no accountability as long as you don't get caught. But in truth, there is a just God and every person will stand before him. And so whether or not justice is done in this life, God sees and knows everything, and justice will be done. That's not bad news in a sense. That's really good news. 
it is bad news because we're all sinners. <laughs> and so we got to figure out our relationship with that holy God. Or we got to get that figured out. But in terms of creation in general, it is much better news that there is a, there is a God who is the just judge than that there is a world with no justice at all. So we've talked about creator, man, sin, and judgment. What a great place to take a break, right? Right before the good news. So we really are. It's 11. And um, so we're going to take just a brief break and then get right back to it. And we're going to start with Noah. And what we're going to see is this amazing insertion of God's grace into the human story. Right when it looks like everything is inevitably going this direction, God cuts right, right through it. So Noah and grace and answers after how long of a break? <laughs> 